Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Barbara. How are you doing today? Good evening, everybody. I'm Doug Bradman, President and CEO of George Washington's Mount Vernon. Great to see you tonight. Thanks for coming out in a dark night. We can do better than that. We're going to have to pick this up. I mean, <laughs> wow. So next month, we will be celebrating 10 years of these book talks, which we started when the George Washington Presidential Library opened. It's really extraordinary. And I can't be more excited than the one we're going to have to finish off. Really, my swan song is the one doing these because, uh, you know, I had this interim. I had to take over the library again and I'm delighted to get this extraordinary book to cap off my time. But first, I want to thank Ford Motor Company because they've sponsored these. And I want to bring us back 100 years ago this year with a young innovator named Henry Ford. It wasn't that young in 1923, but he was an innovator nonetheless. He came to Mount Vernon. He toured the home of George Washington. He, of course, grew up in a house with George Washington's portrait on the wall. And, uh, and of course, he loved Mount Vernon. He fell in love with the smoke jack mechanism that Washington had put into his kitchen to get the smoke going. Uh, when the smoke goes out, it turns the rotisserie of the meat without any human hands touching it. Henry Ford wanted the design of the smoke jack from the director at the time, and he put it into his little Greenfield village out in, uh, in Michigan. But the other thing he was worried about was that Mount Vernon might burn down. And so he gave the Mount Vernon Ladies Association our first fire engine. Uh, fire engine truck. And, uh, and that philanthropic relationship between the Ford Motor Company and the Mount Vernon Ladies Association is 100 years old this year. So thank you so much, Ford Motor Company, for sponsoring this event. <clears throat> now, tonight we're in for a real treat. As I said, a culmination of nine years, really, of great talks on history, on George Washington, and on leadership. I can't think of a better person to cap it off for us. Uh, he is a husband and a father, a sailor and a pilot, a Top Gun instructor. He is an aerospace engineer, an admiral, the ninth vice chairman and joint chiefs of staff. He's a statesman, widely published author. He's a songwriter, and he's a podcaster. You can believe that as well. And his wife, Mary, who joins us tonight with her, he will launch the nonprofit Stop the Addiction Fatality, Addiction Fatality Epidemic. And right now he serves on the President's Intelligence Advisory Board. We're very lucky to have a very intelligent advisor on that board. People always ask me, you know, where are the George Washingtons? And I tell you, they're all around us. They're already serving this nation. Uh, and we have one tonight that represents some of the best elements of character-based leadership in this country. So in short, he is a, a Renaissance man. And, uh, and we're here to talk about his extraordinary life, his memoir, and his vision of leadership, his new book, Sailing Upwind, Leadership and Risk from Top Gun to the Situation Room. Please join me in welcoming Admiral Sandy Winnefield. Admiral. Thank you, sir. I'll go here. I'll go here. Go ahead. Well, thank you for being here at Mount Vernon, Admiral. Uh, let's talk about it. Sailing upwind, what does that mean? Well, first, thanks for the kind introduction, way too kind introduction. And it's uh, awfully nice to be back at Mount Vernon in front of you know many friends out in the audience, but also people I've never met, but pretty impressive crew to come up here and spend time. In the dark of night. In the dark of night. It's also being streamed online, and at yeah. and, and <laughs> some point in the evening, we're going to pass around sheets where you can write questions on them. And also online, if you want to ask a question, someone will take that down and pass it up as well. But thank so you. So you asked about the book. Yeah, the Sailing name? Upwind. What does it mean? So I grew up as a kid and uh, spent a lot of time in San Diego Bay learning to sail. And that had a profound influence on my life and my career. There's so many things about racing a sailboat that apply to everything I did in my career. Yeah. But the other element of Sailing Upwind is, is it's essentially moving a machine against a prevailing force field called the wind. And when you're, when you're going upwind, it's sort of this counterintuitive thing. How on earth do you do that? Mm. And it's uh, sort of a metaphor for fighting the bureaucracy, which I found myself, you know, trying to lead change 
uh, and and that vast bureaucracy that Secretary Del Toro is very well aware of in the Pentagon and elsewhere. So that was a, a dual metaphor there. Yes, you pointed out in my great uh, embarrassment, I've forgotten to mention, we are honored tonight to have Secretary Del Toro, the Secretary of the Navy and his lovely wife, Betty. Thank you so much for joining us this evening as well. Thank you for your service. It's my first time, my first time doing this, so I get nervous. So appreciate, <laughs> appreciate that. Somehow I don't think so. <laughs> but, uh, but that's a great. I mean, that's an extraordinary metaphor. I, I absolutely I think it's apropos. And you, you talked about that, uh, that uh, young life. So you grew up in an, in a Navy family, mm -hmm. uh, and is that why you went into the Navy? Is it that simple, or was there something else going on? You know, I was kind of a rebellious teenager, and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Sounds it, like it. Part of it was, you know, I just want to go to Colorado and do Outward Bound and live in the mountains and, yeah. you know, be that kind of guy. But, you know, I did watch my father. You know, I'm, I'm sort of fourth-generation military. My great-grandfather emigrated from Germany in 1896. He was a Prussian cavalryman. Mm -hmm. uh, and my great-grandfather, or my grandfather was a, a Navy enlisted man in World War II. Tough duty is on a submarine tender in Perth, Australia, but, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And then my dad, I watched my dad as a kid, and you know, you know, there's something called a family business, and I, I grew up in the family business, and said, you know, uh, you know, the thing that really uh, caught my eye was we moved to Virginia Beach uh, right after I graduated from high school, and I saw these guys flying these F-14s around the landing pattern. You know, those guys are probably have I've tried that for a while. Mm. You know, they're having a good time. So yeah, there was an element of following in my father's footsteps, but I really was. I, I wanted to do it differently, so I actually turned down the Naval Academy because I, I, I was worried that I would be unhappy there. I was worried that I would take a slot away from a kid who wanted it more than anything in the world. And you know, ROTC at Georgia Tech was kind of like that one foot in, one foot out. And it didn't take long for me to decide, like, I want, I'm all in. This, yeah. is what I, this is what I want to do. Yeah, so Georgia Tech, aerospace engineering, easy, easy stuff. <laughs> if you're burning the candle at both ends, it's definitely not easy, I can tell you that. Is This is the slide rule era. Yeah, I think we, I had a I had an HP calculator, like oh, a wow. brand new toy back then. And uh, well, you, you've uh, always had the but latest thanks to that, you know, slide rule thing. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to relate to the audience as well here. I still have my dad's slide rule, by the way, for what it's worth. Yeah, that's that's great. So uh, you want to be a pilot? Yeah. And so how do you be? How do you become a pilot if you go to ROTC? Do you just say I'm going to be a pilot, yeah. and they say great? They do. They do service selection, and I was very nervous. Um, because the year that I was graduating from Georgia Tech, they, they needed submariners in the worst way. Mm. And I, I was doing okay grade-wise, and I was worried they were going to draft me into that community. And I, I would have been okay with, with it, but I really wanted to be a pilot. Mm. And somehow it's managed because to... Because your father wanted to be a sub. He wanted to be a submariner. You're yeah. exactly right. Um, um, somehow I managed to evade that mm. and uh, found myself in Pensacola. So w w let me ask you this. The, the, was there a culture difference between the folks who'd come out of the Naval Academy and the folks who came out of ROTC programs at that time? Uh, that's a good question. I, the The only difference really was with the, was that the Naval Academy people, many of them knew each other already. Mm. Not all of them, but mm. most of them knew each other. Mm. And they sort of gravitated towards each other anyway because they sure. had been through that experience. But, the, but uh, to their credit, they weren't ex exclusive of us, you know, simple ROTC folk. Yeah. Well, and I would uh, think know, the, that right away, you know, the pilot program would create a whole different bond. It's a very, it's a very, yeah. I think the bigger uh, gradient there was there were people who came into that Navy flight program that had thousand hours of flight time. Oh, right. And they were like, I'm bad. So you'd never I'm going to be a Blue Angel. Yeah, you know, right, it's like right. in 10 flights, there. you know, it's even. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so you'd never flown anything by then. I had, I had solo. The Navy had a great program called the Flight Introduction Program that they actually do now with, for everybody when they get to Pensacola. But when I was at Georgia Tech, I actually soloed. And I think the Navy wisely figured that the investment required in, in deciding whether somebody was going to be suitable for aviation, you know, for that pittance that it takes to get you to solo, rather than sending them all the way down to Pensacola, getting them through ground school, getting them through 10 or 15 flights, only to decide this person is not going to work out. It was a, a good financial decision. And so I lapped it up at Georgia Tech. And, and I, not only, I did that, and I went to Army Airborne School, and I kind of figured out that I'm okay in the air. I like this. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, and and so then you you got selected for jets. How did how does that work? You you uh, it, it's a little bit of a crapshoot. You know, go all the way through flight school, and the last week mm. before you get your wings uh, is when they look at the needs of the Navy. Really? Uh, and they look at your preference, 
Uh, and so the last week of my primary flight training uh, was when I got selected for jets. I could have just as easily been selected for helicopters or P3s or whatever, but I was fortunate that week that they needed jet pilots. So off I went to Kingsville, Texas. And then, then the next thing is when you finish Kingsville is what actual jet are you going to get to fly? Right. And now the, you wanted the F-14 Tomcat. I did. And the, the vast majority of people now are flying some variant of the F-18. And any of those airplanes is like really cool. Yeah. Um, back then, it was, you know, the F-14, the A-6 or the A-7. And, you know, the F-14 was kind of the brand new sexy machine. It's a fighter airplane, mm -hmm. not a bomber. And uh, that's what I really wanted to do. When do you get your call sign? <laughs> so um, you can get, you, you start getting a call sign in the training command. And I got this call sign magic, uh, no fault of my own, but I was leading a, a you know, you, when you're learning to fly formation, you know, you're the, the lead for a while and you're, you're trying to struggle to learn how to fly formation. And I just got lucky one day and trimmed up the airplane. So it was just like perfectly straight and level and put my hands up and my wingman, who was a friend of mine said, that was magic. You're magic now. Mm -hmm. So I show up in my first fleet squadron and they go, what's your call sign? Magic. They go, no. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, you're too new to be a magic. And by the way, we already have a magic. So, so figure something out. And, uh, and I looked up on this, what we call a greenie board, which is where all the competitive landing grades are for pilots. And all the call signs are up there. And I saw this CJ. I wonder, how did this guy get his call sign? Well, his initials are CJ. I went, my initials are J-A-W. So I'll be Jaws. And only later did I find out, Naval Aviation has a way of getting at you, right? That uh, behind my back, people were saying, oh, just Admiral Winnefeld's son. <laughs> uh, it's like, That's okay, good. you got to have a thick skin in this business. That's good. That's <laughs> and good. by the way, if you hate it, they'll give you something else that you don't like. I love that. So one of the things you write in here is that, and I got a number of beautiful quotes from this extraordinary book, which I encourage everybody to buy. It is the giving season, so buy a many. <laughs> uh, humility is the most important element of leadership. Absolutely. So what, what does that mean? You know, I, I talk about five sort of anchors of leadership, you know, it's mm -hmm. leading yourself, which is very important, uh, leading people, leading organizations, um, leading execution and leading change. And the very first thread of the very first one anchor is lead your, of leading yourself is character. Mm -hmm. And within character, it's about uh, humility. It's about um, courage and it's about integrity. But you, you cannot be, you, you can be, a, a, you know, what is it? Um, Shakespeare said some people are, are, are uh, born to greatness, some people achieve greatness, and some people have greatness thrust upon them. You know, you can be named a leader, but if you're not a humble leader, you're not a good leader. You'll mm -hmm. never be a good leader. Well, and, we and that's genuine humility, by the way, not false humility. Well, that's, yeah, well, that was going to be the, the question is, uh, you know, genuine humility. Is that something you had to learn? Is there a lot of ego in pilots? and uh, you know, kind of aggressive, um, you know, sense that you're better than other people or better than other people serving. And, and you know, where did, where did you learn that sense of humility? Yeah, it's, it, it's a, a really good question. You know, fighter pilots are not necessarily genetically humble. <clears throat> um, well, you did write a book with uh, your yeah. face on it. I mean, <laughs> hey, uh, that was not my choice for a cover, by the way. <laughs> I designed this really cool cover. I had a guy put it together. It was a sailboat. Yeah. It had an F-14 coming from behind. It was beautiful. <laughs> and Naval Institute people go, sorry, we're in control of this, and we're putting your face no, on know. the cover. Oh, we've, anyway. We've, we've all so, suffered. So you do, you know, I, I, over time, initially you go, wow, I got F-14s. Wow, I made it through the training squadron. Wow, I'm in a fleet squadron. Yeah, you and, make your big stuff. <clears throat> but there's <clears throat> that, that community, that business is so good about at, at leveling you. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Uh, but you still have to be careful. Uh, it, it's one of those things that you discover, I think, by experience. It's like, you know, it doesn't work to not be humble. And, I, and I'm observing other people who are not. It's not working for them. So I'm not going to be that way. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing that one of the things you're kind of obsessed with, I think, is this idea of innovation. And, and mm -hmm. uh, where, where in this early stage in your career when you're still learning, you know, where you're learning how to fly, mm -hmm. you're learning how to be part of a squadron, you know, where, where is that? innovation or coming you know where, where are you seeing that or experiencing that yeah i think i was uh, <clears throat> the the spark of wanting to be innovative came from my uncle <clears throat> uh, who was uh who had gone to the naval academy uh, younger than my father <clears throat> and left after two years because he was he was getting patents in in jet engines hmm. as a sophomore at the naval academy 
and he felt that the Naval Academy wow. could was Slow not learner. This yeah, one, yeah. yeah. And, and he felt the Naval Academy wasn't giving him the freedom to innovate the way you know uh, to do the academic thing that he wanted to do. Yeah. So he left, and he ended up as a rocket scientist for a while, and ended up a Rand Corporation as one of the most highly respected defense analysts uh, right. ever. And I just remember spending time with him and and seeing how he challenged every assumption. He really worked very hard to see the other side of the problem, um, even if he didn't agree with the other side of the problem. Yeah. And that that sort of sort of set a spark in me, like you know, you can challenge the assumptions and and it works. Uh, and, you know, you really need to do this. And so I brought that into the fighter business uh, and started challenging assumptions and saw that it was starting to work. And got, and then got really hungry to do that because it's fun. So one of the first you know, extraordinary things in your early career. You're selected for U.S. Navy Fighter Weapons School. That's Top Gun. <laughs> You've heard of that. Um, how do you get selected to go to Top Gun? So uh, it, it, when in I went movie, through it's pretty cool how they get selected because these other guys are selected. We're going to fly rubber dog poo to Hong Kong or something yeah, like that, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so back when I went through the class as a student, it, yeah. uh, in a squadron, uh, one one turnaround cycle for deployments, uh, they would send one crew through Top Gun at the B students, and the mm -hmm. the the theory was you would learn, you get your masters in you know being a fighter pilot, and you go back and it was train the trainer, mm -hmm. and so that's what I got to do. Nowadays it's a little different. They take people at the end of their first tour, send them through Top Gun, and then they go back for another shorter tour as a training officer. Be that as it may, I've I felt very very fortunate because I was with some pretty talented people. Very fortunate to have been selected to be the guy during that turnaround cycle mm. uh, with my backseater to go through as, as a student. And then they brought you back to be an instructor, so you must have done well. <clears throat> Did you win the uh, prize? Is there a prize? Yeah, you know, in the movie, they have the Top Gun Trophy. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. there's no you such... You want to get your name on that wall. There's no such thing as the Top Gun Trophy. Uh, um, but what they do have is very interesting is, is first of all, the students are, are uh, asked to fill out a very thorough critique of the class while they're going through it. And then, you know, you have to perform in the air. You have to show that you can debrief not only the what, but the why behind the what uh, mm -hmm. for all these flights that you do. Yeah. And so you're being sort of quietly judged by the instructors as you go through. And at the end of the class, after the class has graduated and left, instructors would spend all afternoon reading every single critique. You know, does this person have a brain and do they care? And then they would reflect and we, we would put names on a what list, the list. And these were people that we would be willing to bring back as Top Gun instructors. Mm -hmm. It was a secret. Um, yeah. And it was just between us and what we call the detailers in the Navy, who are the people who assigned uh, people. And so when we had an empty instructor slot, we would go to the detailers and say, OK, um, here's the list. Here's the list. And we'd like this guy. Yeah, it, well, and back then it was all guys. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, you know, obviously women are able to do the uh, combat flying as well. And so I, for all I know, there's probably uh, female instructors there as well. So one of the extraordinary coincidences of your career is that the movie Top Gun was being made while you were an instructor there. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty uh, pretty interesting. Uh, they brought us a script, and we looked at the script, and we, we were trying to figure out, well, do we just run away from this thing because it's so bad, <laughs> uh, or do we try to fix it for them? Yeah. And we had a we we assigned a guy named Bob Willard, who ended up being the commander of Pacific Command, for immensely talented, gifted officer, former defensive tackle for Naval Academy, and he was kind of like the project officer to fix this thing. And they ended up uh, shooting the movie, and um, it was pretty interesting experience well Mary got the, to watch the volleyball scene you know well, well i was gonna say <laughs> one of the cool story doubles are pretty good looking i hear i don't know <laughs> so my, well you were one of them right so what i understand is part of that story was that uh, of course you met mary mm -hmm. thank you mary for being here tonight the book is dedicated to mary and she's an important figure in the book uh you met her in a bar i did uh, just like in the, the film. bar, I met her in the bar, in that same bar, and you came out singing that song. No. But you sang Sinatra. You didn't sing. No, no, no. It wasn't. It was a little yeah. different story. So, so oh, yeah. same bar though, same um, bar. where uh, you know, across the street from from this Miramar Officers Club is a bachelor officers quarters, and mm -hmm. and I lived off the base, but I came there to do my laundry. In the afternoon. We all go to bars for our laundry. Sure. Well, I did the yeah. bachelor officer uh, club. Yeah. So anyway, this was on a Wednesday uh, afternoon, and Wednesday evening was like the big night at this officer's club. The, yeah. the night, you know, that you see in the movie. Uh -huh. And and Mary had met, uh, was in San Diego for the summer, had met uh, a gal who was actually the daughter of a Navy widow and had an ID card. And it was like, okay, pst, you know, they have a dollar, all you can eat Mexican food in the afternoon and in the evening at this officer's club. So let's go there. So they, they were smart enough not to be there at the sort of meat market evening. They were there in the afternoon.
Right. So I was the only guy. I was I was doing my laundry and going and having a beer and doing my laundry. So I got the nickname the laundry man. But, Suds and duds. But I, been so I name. sat down with this table full of beautiful women and and uh, luckily for me I I connected with Mary and we we What song you know, did you sing? <clears throat> if you had listened to me I would not have dared <laughs> dared sing. That's that's uh, that's fascinating. But well, one thing I did find fascinating about that story was that the the female uh love interest in the movie was based on a phd she female was. uh christine fox yep. who, who you met there and then ended up working with your whole career in different ways um tell us tell us a little bit about that the civilian experts who come in to top gun to to help yeah. uh, help teach so so christine uh who is a gifted woman i'm she's amazing uh was a phd uh, working for the Center for Naval Analysis and wasn't technically assigned to Top Gun. She was assigned okay. to the, the base, mm. you know, for, to, for all the squadrons. But, you know, clearly she wanted to be associated with the you know, leading edge of fighter tactics. So, mm. uh, and I had taken over uh, something called the Top Gun Journal, which was a ratty, crappy magazine that we would put out. And I wanted to turn it into, into a real quality magazine. And, and, we worked on that with some other folks, but uh, Christine and I collaborated on an article about electromagnetic warfare, hmm. uh, electronic warfare, which is, you know, to a caveman like me, I wanted I wanted to make sure that all all my dumb fellow fighter pilots and I could understand this. And you know, it's very technical. And, hmm. and we collaborated on this article to to demystify it. And that's when I, you know, the force is strong in this one. Uh, <laughs> And uh, you know th they picked up on her for the for the model for the the movie, and then I, as you point out, I worked with her on many different ways later on to the point yeah. where we were ultimately she was ultimately the deputy secretary of defense. Uh, we've been on the Naval Institute board of directors together. A remarkable. And you uh, drew on her expertise when you needed an expert to come out and help you with the surface. Right. Um, uh, when I was the uh, strike group commander, at Theodore yeah. Roosevelt Carrier Strike Group. Yeah. You know, every strike group has a uh, center for naval analysis representative. Usually, a very young person. They're, they're hey, here's what the fleet's like. You know, mm -hmm. go out there and do good. And I, I had observed from previous deployments that they weren't used very well. Always, they, they kind of went off and did their own thing. And I said, I told Christine, I want your best mm -hmm. because I have some serious projects I need this person to yeah. work. And well, she that goes gave to your, me. your innovation at that level. I want to talk yeah. about that story yeah. uh, in a moment uh, when we get there. Um, but but uh, this. What strikes me is you're describing, is the Navy a small community? I mean, is it, you're going to run, in your book, you you run across people, I mean, somebody who worked, well, Mullins, it was with your father, mm -hmm. and then he ends up, you know, you know, you working for him. So, I mean, it's an extraordinary small community, at least yeah. in, in your telling. Is yours a unique ride through the Navy, or is, is everybody kind of coming back and forth with folks they've served with throughout their career? I don't know. I think Secretary Del Toro may, may be able to, you know, project on this as well, but I think it's a community of communities for one thing. You know, there's the yeah. submarine community, the aviation yeah. community, the service community, and there's there's a lot of um, you know, uh, you bump into peach people whether you're in a job in the Pentagon, so now you're in a cubicle with a submariner, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I also think present company accepted. Um, the 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 cream, that's the humility. The cream, right there. the cream sort of you know, you know, you, you bump, you know, Jim Stavert has visited me at Top Gun one time because he was a brand new ops officer on an Aegis destroyer and wanted to learn about air defense. So he came and visited me, and I went, "The force is strong in this one." Too. <laughs> you know, so, so you, you, you know, the, the, the people who are folks, really eager yeah. to to make a difference yeah. kind of find each other. Yeah, and that, well, that's uh, one of the things you point out. This you, you really need to be learning things on the outside of your oh yeah path. absolutely. You, you know, never that. know when you'll need it, and it also serves you well. Now, one of the things you do do, which was unusual at the time, is you take a, a position in the Pentagon rather than staying yeah. in a pilot seat. Yeah. So why did you do that? So uh, <clears throat> this was after my department head tour, and um, you know everybody was saying, "Well, you need to stay in the cockpit. You know, keep your reputation going. Yeah. Um, you know, so you can screen for command." And so all you this. want to command a a, 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 a fighter squadron. A squadron. Yeah. yeah. And I figured, well, if I don't have enough of a reputation having been a Top Gun instructor, then I'm not going to get it any better, you know, going off and, and being a, a, a instructor at the Fleet Replacement Squadron. Uh, and I heard this little thing called Goldwater Nichols, which was a law that was passed in 1987, I think, that, that said, you know, if you want to be a flag officer in the Navy, you're going to have, or any, any service, you have to have a joint job working with the other services, and you have to get this uh, education. And I, I honestly never woke up in the morning thinking, what do I have to do today to be an admiral? But there was, so there was some uh, sort of imperative in the 80s, which is saying that the, the, the branches need to work 
better together. Absolutely. And, and that was, yeah. that came out of desert one. It yeah. came out of the, the, um, Granada. down in Granada. And, and it was an absolutely brilliant move, uh, to get the services, you know, cultures working together. And I can go on forever on that. It was very, very important. And I just said, you know, I, I wasn't waking up asking what did I need to do to be an admiral. It's like, well, I'm more likely to screen for command if I've positioned myself, yeah. if I if I buy into this. And I went. And uh, well, my, I get the sense from reading, and not that you're thinking about your rank, and you're, you are thinking about things you want to do. You want to yeah. command an aircraft. Yeah. What's carrier. the next step? Yeah, I yeah. mean, you, so you want to you want to lead. Yeah, I mean, so you want to find position, a way to make difference. Yeah. Exactly. If you want to position yourself for the next step, then you probably ought to be positioning yourself for a step that's beyond yeah. that without really thinking. Because because I really uh, was worried that if I was waking up thinking about being an admiral, that I would be uh, risk averse, that I would be yeah. under undermining my peers. I didn't want to do any of that. Um, mm -hmm. So it was just like, what's next? Well, so one of the things you, you work in this joint staff position and you also get pulled out by Colin Powell to yeah. serve as his aide. Tell, tell us a little about that. So I, you know, when I first got to the joint staff, they said, you're going to work on the operations branch in the Western hemisphere side. And we had just finished the Grenada or the, uh, the the Panama operation. I'm going, oh, great. I'm going to show up and all these guys are heroes and I'm just going to be the new guy and it's yeah. going to be terrible. And the day I show up, they go, no, you're going to be in the central command branch, which is the Arabian Gulf and Middle East. And I went, okay, that's what I know. That's where I've deployed. So yeah. thank you. And then, I mean, right literally in, in the next six months is when Saddam Hussein is rattling. The Two things are happening. The, the Berlin Wall is falling. You know, the Soviet Union is collapsing. Mm. And Saddam Hussein is rattling his saber. And those of us in the central command branch are going, excuse me, we have a problem over here in Iraq. Oh, no, no, they're our ally. Everything's fine. No, no, really, we have a problem here. And so we got ourselves ready for that and, and ended up, uh, you know, over the course of the following year. So I, I sort of was on the skyline a little bit uh, yeah. being in that job. So Powell noticed me. He needed an aide on very short notice because he had to, frankly, fire an army guy. Just saying. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Sorry about the game and, this weekend. And he, you know, he literally plucked me out of nowhere and because he needed somebody quickly. And, yeah. and it was great. I got to do it for a year. And learning from that man was, was a, a priceless experience. Well, Colin Powell, Colin Powell uh, extraordinary man, as you say, his last public interview was done here at Mount Vernon. Was it really? Yeah, it was in the mansion, George Washington's mansion house. Remarkable um, guy. What, uh, what, did you, what did you take uh, from <laughs> Colin Powell you know, that's in this book? There are there are a number of things. One, uh, incredible poise. Um, he he uh, managed to combine the chutzpah of being a kid who grew up, grew up in the Bronx with a guy who had been the national security advisor. So he had he had it down. I mean, he could mm -hmm. he could go in your face, but he also knew what he was talking about there. So that was you know that was yet another example for me of how terribly important it is to to learn broadly, not mm -hmm. just deeply. Mm -hmm. uh, he had an immense uh, care for the people who worked for him. And, and, you know, I, I say this in the book, it's one of my leadership things under leading people, oh. which, and, and I've, you know, my son does this is, uh, you know, the essence of leading people is holding them to the highest possible standard at the same time you take the best possible care of them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a happy, a happy little lingo, but that's what Colin Powell told me in the car one day. Mm -hmm. He was just musing, you know, Sandy, the essence of leading people. And I went, how profound is that? Yeah. I'm going to live my life that Did way. You keep a little notebook and, and write these difference. things down. Well, not on the yeah, the, yeah. Trap. Actually, uh, it, it, a little bit of ingestion in in the brain, and not, you know, you never forget something like that. Um, yeah. But sometimes I would write things like that down. But it was it's a great way of leading people. You hold them to the high standard, and, and you know, if you do only one of those two things, it doesn't work. Mm. But if you do both of those, it's magic. It's literally magic if you can do that for young men and women who join the service and any other leadership situation you're in. People love to be held to a high standard. Well, but so they also out, want to be taken care of. So out of the Pentagon, you got to apply that lesson right away as the squadron commander yes. um, of the, uh, what were we, the checkmates. Yes. F-14. The fight, fighting checkmates, yeah. Right. And so there's an interesting story in here about um, your recognition. <clears throat> really, uh, you know, you trained all these aerial combat missions and mm -hmm. you're training jets to fight other jets in the air and then. You know, all of a sudden, it looks like uh, you, these you're going to have to do much more air to ground work. Yeah, the the uh, um, the world was changing back then. Uh, the whole purpose of the F-14, essentially, uh, during the Cold War, was to prevent the Russians from sinking an aircraft carrier with air to surface missiles. Hmm. Well, that went away overnight, right? Hmm. And yeah, we still had a fighter role where you might have to go in and escort strikes and keep the bad guys off of your bombers and all that kind of stuff. But but you know, it was really you know precious acreage on a flight deck. 
you know, unless you can drop a bomb, you're not going to be worth it anything to us mm-hmm. and i i was telling guys like you know the, the f-14 was was originally designed to be able to drop bombs it just wasn't its primary mission but nobody had ever done it because we were cool fire guys mm-hmm. um and and i said hey look we got to shift into this and so we were the first squadron to go out there and really aggressively train to that mission to the point where i actually hired you know the a6 community was going away hired a bright department head out of that community to come into my squadron and be a department head where most of the other squatters were going, I ain't taking no stinking ground pounding guy. You know, I was like, no, I got to have this guy. And he really was brilliant in, yeah. in teaching us that business. So how were you able among so many others to kind of see that happening in real time? Was it because you were in the Pentagon or just because you have this yeah. bent towards constantly trying to think, uh, you know, from an oblique angle of a problem? I think there were a couple of things. One, um, challenging the assumptions. Another was uh, always, always being suspicious of institutional ego, hmm. not only personal ego, but institutional ego. It's like we're fighter guys. You know, we're not going to do any of that stinking, you no. know, low rent out air to ground stuff. No, actually, we got, you know, shed that. Uh, and I think the, the combination of those things just said, you know, we got to do this. I mean, what kind of, or we're going to lose our relevance. What kind of conversation at the time was going on about, well, the Cold War is ending and so we have to completely rethink you know, the, uh, you know, our force levels and the kind of force we have, was it there yet? Or did that have to wait until later in the nineties? Yeah, I think, um, the, the force structure was under immense pressure, uh, at the close of the Vietnam war. Mm-hmm. And, and then, you know, you had the Reagan years where there was a defense buildup, uh, you know, it kind of, you know, fluctuated yeah. back and forth and, and it's always been a, you know, a, a challenge, but I think one of the things that, uh, that really impacted this was the the uh, second Gulf War was was a, a major factor and it, it was very uh, uh, catalytic for the Navy because we had a secretary named Don Runsfeld who looked at the fact that like you know you've only got two carriers deployed at a time here on your normal peacetime rotation yeah. but we have like two out of twelve, 12 of them. right yeah it's like what the heck you know as a businessman you know capital out you know use, use of your capital assets not that's yeah. not very good yeah. now and then the Gulf Gulf War happens, and and we managed to cobble together six or seven carriers to get over there, mm-hmm. and um, and came back. But it was it was still an immense threat to the Navy's relevance, budget, you know, and all of that. And and so Vern Clark put me on this project to you know figure this out, and we yeah. figured that we actually had more readiness than we were really giving ourselves credit for, mm-hmm. and and that kind of helped to save the day uh, in, in terms of that particular budget battle. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and as secretary del Toro will tell you, he lives it every day. We're in a similar budget battle right now. Um, more so, on that later, maybe. Now I want to talk about the, the Navy nuclear program, which is really an extraordinary success in American history. It's what, 70 years old now. More than that. There's yeah. never been an accident. No. Although I, you know, I, I, I really, I, I withdraw that. It's not an accident that there's been no accident. Right. Well, right, right. I mean, but there, I mean. It's the kind of program where you can't have an accident. Yeah. So yeah. How, how has that been managed? So it all starts with a guy named Rickover, who, who has this reputation for eating his young, which, you know, uh, if anybody who ever went and interviewed with him, fortunately I did not, would tell you, yeah, this guy's a maniac. But, <laughs> but he actually was, was quite brilliant in designing that program to bring in the, the, the finest, most conservative designs for nuclear power plants, uh, building them with the best possible materials, um, and uh, above all, making sure that the people operating those propulsion plants were, were trained, you know, uh, in, in more than they think they needed to be trained in, and that they had an absolute set of operational excellence principles under which they worked. And I can, you know, they were never really listed for me when I went through that program, but I can rile them up. It's, you know, integrity, level of knowledge, procedural compliance, mm. formal communications, forceful backup, and a questioning attitude. Ba 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 ba. You know, boom. Yeah. I mean, and if you do all six of those things, and they're very interrelated, you you can prevent almost anything. You know, and and if if you take when you have a close call and you debrief it in the context of those principles, like okay, which of these was violated? Usually, it's more than one, yeah. and you only reinforce the principles when you debrief them in that context. It's a it's a great system. Um, it's a life. It's a very difficult program to get through, yeah. but uh, it's a life changing um, uh, thing that. It really makes you look at technology and and process and operational excellence through a completely different lens. Well, the the principles of the, they they show up in your leadership guidelines they do. here in different ways, they, and you use them with your team a lot. Yeah, I took I took the nuclear principles and applied them to everything I did after that. Whether you're working on a flight deck, 
you're uh, working on an un a refueling rig, you know, very dangerous rig uh, between two ships, or whether you're working in the North Northern Command mm -hmm. and NARAD headquarters, you know, you've got to yeah. live by those principles. They work. So let's talk about culture. That's when you talk about leading, is it institutions or teams where culture comes important? So I guess it's, in, it's institutions. It's, it's in, it's, uh, I talk about culture and leading organizations. Organization. Yeah. So culture. So how do you change a culture of an organization? That seems to be somewhat hard. Yeah, there's a, there's a, a, a really interesting book that I would always leaf through before I took over a leadership job. It's, it's, it's called The First 90 Days, I think, or something like that. And it would talk about different transition situations. You, are you taking over? A, are you doing a startup? Are you taking over a turnaround? Or are you taking over right. something that's actually going well, sustainment? Yeah. So w when you need to change the culture, you, you just have to dive in deeply as a leader and express what that culture is going to be uh, very loudly, very frequently. If you're not tired of hearing yourself say it, you're not saying it enough. And what you what you really can't do, because I'm on the board of a company where I asked the CEO one day, you know, what's tell me, you know, what's our culture? And the guy points to the wall and there's five things on the wall. He says, that's our culture. I said, well, you know, everybody has five things on their wall, <laughs> but not everybody has good culture. Yeah. You know, it's about do people want to run to work in the morning? Uh, you know, are they, are they just, do they feel like they're um, making a difference? Do they feel like they're being treated fairly? Mm. Uh, do they feel like they have a voice? You know, those kinds of things. That's culture. Uh, you can draw that from what's on the, on the wall, but you got to live it every day and, and force it in as a leader. It's, it's something that's very hard to build and very easy to destroy. One of the things I liked in, in your description of it was that it's the, the leaders uh, really living the culture and the people that they yeah. appoint in living the culture. Yeah, this is Vern Clark. And quoting, really, you can, you can build a culture from top down. No, you're right. And Vern Clark used to quote, I don't know, um, somebody, uh, and it's like, uh, culture is the collective behavior of the senior leadership. No. So that if the senior leader is inculcating, good word, culture into uh, the senior leaders, uh, but the other thing is you have to get down to the deck plates every now and then, spend a little bit of time down there mm -hmm. and, and make sure, you know, sniff around with nobody around you, no senior guys around you. And, and you can tell pretty quickly if the culture's penetrated to the deck plates. I like, I like that. Um, I'm not going to get, I can too walk much onto the, the bridge the of a ship. Plates smell like it's some of the yeah, I can walk on the bridge of a ship and, and yeah. it's getting underway. And in 10 or 15 minutes, I can tell you whether the culture on that ship is good or not. Well, let's talk about a ship you changed the culture on, uh, which was your Gator, the USS yeah. Cleveland, yeah. amphibious. Uh, just give uh, everybody that little anecdote about... Uh, oh, the change in. Yeah, but you, know, the, you, you, you came across a, a ship in which the people you felt didn't uh, feel comfortable. Yeah. So in our surface community, I didn't realize this. I was an aviator taking over a surface ship, right? Mm. In our surface community, it's like the outgoing CO hates the incoming CO because he's taking his baby away from mm. him. And, and so, so uh, usually it's like the, the, the incoming commanding officer spends like one day on the ship. That's all he's like. I, I went up and showed up 10 days earlier and the guy's going, what are you doing here? Right. Yeah. You know, you're underfoot. Yeah. But it gave me a chance to observe him. And uh, my change of command was in Hawaii. So, so I ride the ship. That's why you showed up early. There you go. <laughs> With my whole family in tow. <laughs> <laughs> so we were, we were driving the ship into Hawaii, and I noticed that the conning officer, who was the person who was giving the helm orders to the you know the guy who's got the wheel, is the the, the captain standing like right next to him. Mm. And the conning officer would go, you know, Captain, um, I want to come a, a degree right. Uh, uh, make it a half a degree, okay? And and that's just stifling. And that poor kid, you know. So mm. I, we you know we did the change of command in Hawaii, and we have our navigation brief to come out and I, I told the guys look I'm going to be sitting in this chair on the other side of the bridge and you're you're driving the ship mm. and if you are 10 feet right of where I would be in the channel I'm not going to say anything now if you do something I really don't like I'm going to speak up and don't you dare look at me or ask me for permission for a helm mm. you know course change drive the ship it took him a whole month to figure that out I had to actually in order to get that sort of reinforced in the bridge team. Yeah. I had to take the conning officer one day up to the flying bridge in the open air where, you know, I have a voice, to, okay, come right, you know, five days. And everybody was acutely uncomfortable. Like, this is not safe. I go, no, yeah. we're driving into San Diego Bay, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and we did it and people finally got it. Yeah. Uh, that they, they could actually be themselves. Yeah, it's empowering them with trust yeah. as well. Trust being such yeah. a critical thing to yeah. let, let people do. Yeah. 
let's get to the main event. I mean, we're we're really wasting time. Let's get to it. Uh, the Big E, USS uh, Enterprise. Takes your breath away. What's so special about uh, the USS Enterprise? Well, you know, all of our aircraft carriers are named after people, most of whom are, all of whom are politicians, right? Dwight D. Eisenhower, Harry S. Truman, John C. Stennis, great ships. Um, USS George Washington. There you go. Oh, that one. Good ship, too, by the way. Yes. Uh, has been through a little tough times lately, but they're coming out of it, and they're doing really well. Bill um, Broad. The uh, Enterprise was the only one that's not named after a person, and it was named after its seven predecessors, some of which were quite famous. Its immediate predecessor was the World War II Enterprise, the most highly decorated ship of World War II called the Galloping Ghost of the Oahu Coast. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't realize the third Enterprise was in the Barbary Pirate Wars. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. was, you've heard of the burning of the frigate Philadelphia. Um, right. the, the crew of USS Enterprise, led by Stephen Decatur, uh, actually did that act. And Horatio uh, Nelson called it the most daring act of the age. So there was a, quite, a, quite a bit of history there, but I didn't have a room. We built one with the help of Enterprise Rent-A-Car, thankfully. Uh, they gave us a little money to do that because the founder of Enterprise Rent-A-Car flew Hellcats off of the World War II Enterprise. That's great. Um, yeah. And, you know, a remarkable, you know, twinkle in his eye fighter pilot. Um, That's fantastic. And don't, don't let your daughter near him. But um, he, but that was, it, it was such a breathtaking thing to be the captain of that ship. It was the most amazing job I've ever had. Well, and you were there at a historic uh, moment as well after another attack uh, on our country. 9-11 uh, happens yeah. when you're steaming back home, essentially, yeah. from the Arabian Gulf. And so yeah. tell, tell us a little bit about that uh, event. When, when do you learn about the, the attack on the towers? So uh, on the, we were outside the Strait of Hormuz running. Everything was all buttoned up, airplanes put away, running as, south as fast as we could because we were going to be the first carrier ever to visit South Africa. We were all looking forward to that, but we had to go really fast to get there. And Was uh, South Africa going somewhere? Or? No, but it's a long way away. Yeah. We wanted to get home. <laughs> and we, yeah, yeah. So, so I got a phone call from my safety officer, yeah. uh, and this was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, which was 9 o'clock in the morning and, and on the East Coast here. He says, you know, you need to turn on the TV. So I flip on the TV, and what I see is the first World Trade Center towers burning. And there's this confused commentary that we all remember. of Was it was that a little private plane flew into this thing, or was it a terrorist? What's going on here? And at that moment, I saw the second airplane hit the second tower. It's like, we're not going anywhere because um, it was probably Osama bin Laden, or who knows? Maybe it was somebody in Iraq. But uh, so there's a little folklore associated with this that says, you know, I threw my white scarf over my shoulder and ordered Enterprise to turn north towards Pakistan, and I'm a hero. That's not how these things really mm -hmm. work. Usually there's a few admirals involved, mm -hmm. you know, and, but, we, but we did uh, one thing that I'm particularly proud of, and th this is a good leadership lesson, where as a leader, a lot of your people bring you problems, expecting you to solve them. And, and we were told that we needed to be off the coast, a particular spot off the coast of Pakistan by like 8 o'clock the next morning. And so my navigator comes to me and says, well, we got to go 25 knots to get there, Captain. And my maintenance aircraft maintenance people go, well, we got to do a bunch of elevator moves, and we can only do elevator moves at 20 knots because it's too dangerous to do them faster than that. Yeah. So your problem, Captain. Because the elevators will go down, and you'll get water. and Well, if, the if ship you or... have to turn the ship to evade another ship, you can heal the ship, yeah. and the elevator digs in, and you can lose yeah. airplanes and people, and it's not a pretty sight. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I said, we're going to go 30 knots. <laughs> And it's like, we're going to go 30 knots, and when we are ready, to, you know, we'll get all the airplanes ready on the elevators, and when it's time, we'll slow down to 20 knots, we'll run the elevators down, run them back up, and then we'll accelerate. Such a simple solution, average 20 knots. But in, it just shows that in the heat of the moment, in a crisis, people withdraw into their own stovepipes yeah. and, and solve the problem inside their stovepipe. Mm. And you, as the leader, have to be able to integrate this stuff and go, here's what we're going to do. And sometimes it's quite simple. Sometimes it's really hard. So then the Enterprise was on station and able to fly some of the earliest sorties yep. uh, into Afghanistan. Yep, absolutely. Extraordinary, yep. extraordinary. Um, that, I think there's some uh, cards circulating around here. There, you can ask some questions, although I don't see Stephen anywhere. So let's start getting those circulated so we have a few. Um, it, it's such an extraordinary full uh, life and book. Um, Theodore Roosevelt Carrier Strike Group. How do you go from the Enterprise to a strike group? Were you in the Pentagon again? Or in, in, yeah, you were. Because how do you go from being, here you are, 
big shot skipper of a an aircraft carrier, and then all of a sudden you're in the Pentagon as just another Navy captain working on somebody's yeah. staff. Yeah, exactly. That was, must be was, that's was, such a strange thing. It'd it be really, like a CEO leaving a company and then just going to work on some other CEO's staff. Yeah, it was not. Um, it was not wonderful, but I mean, um, <laughs> you know. So I, but, but, it's, I, but it happens a lot, right? I mean, yeah. you go from these commands, and then all yeah. of a sudden you're part of a sure a staff team. But one of the great things about the Navy yeah. nuclear aviation pipeline, yeah. you know, you 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 uh, have a deep draft, you have an XO of an aircraft carrier, you know, you're right. is you spend most of your time as a Navy captain at mm. sea, mm. which is not so great for your family, as Mary would say, but yeah. it was great for me because I'm not in the Pentagon. Mm. But then all of a sudden, you know, bang, you find yourself sitting at a desk, and uh, so I did that. And I went down to Norfolk and had a job down there and mm. uh, and then had a, another job down there. And finally, they go, OK, we're going to make you a strike group commander. What was your least favorite job in the Navy? My least favorite job in the Navy wasn't in the Navy. It was uh, well, that at, doesn't count. It's got Joint Forces good. Command. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so I went out and, I, and I'm, I'm in charge of, of, of innovation for the entire joint community. Yep. Uh, and you're, I, known, you're a known innovator. Yep. You're a known risk taker. Yep. Sounds like a perfect thing for you. And I show up and there's like four four senior civilians, SESs for most for right. most of you. And and they it, first of all, it took me a year to to pry out of them where the money was. Yeah. Okay. Because and and they they hated each other, undercut each other. It was just not fun to be in that environment. Mm -hmm. There was, you know, the innovation piece was fun, but I didn't feel very fulfilled in that job. Yeah. I was happy to leave. So were you just writing reports that nobody read? You couldn't do anything? No, we we actually were making a difference, I think, on the ground in Iraq with some of the command and control systems that our yeah. troopers were using, yeah. um, and a few other things, you know. Uh, but I, I just didn't feel as fulfilled as I'd like to be. The one the one thing I really got out of that tour was working with a guy named General uh, Gary Luck, who was in, on the training side of Joint Forces Command, and, and I, I called him Yoda because he's just this sort of little. He kind of looked like Yoda, you know. Mm. Uh, was but he was green? also. Well, Lord and green. Nobody drank a lot of coffee. Yeah, uh, that's it. But you know, he was just a very wise, um, thoughtful, philosophical guy. You know, um, yeah. and I felt like I was getting a lot out of him. So you're always learning. That's that's, yeah. I guess, a good sign. But the carrier strike group, Theodore Roosevelt, yeah. big stick. Yep. What is a strike group? A strike group is an uh, an aircraft carrier and its air wing. So you've got the captain of the aircraft carrier and the air wing commander on the same ship mm -hmm. underneath you, and your your sort of headquarters is on the carrier. Right. And then you have uh, several uh, guided missile destroyers, maybe a, a guided missile cruiser or two, and a submarine, and you know, an, an assemblage of supporting ships. Every one of them is different. And we used um, to call these battle groups, didn't we? Yeah, we used to call them battle groups. Then you know, you call them carrier strike groups. Then you call them strike groups. And, you know. It's all semantics. Uh, mm. Somebody got a fitness report out of it or something, but mm. but it was really in a, it, it's the just the core fighting uh, 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 group yeah. in the in the U.S. Navy, other than our amphibious side of the Navy. Um, you know that that's where you go fight, and you can you can disassemble it, you know, disaggregate it, and go do all kinds of things, or you can bring it back together and fight as a unit. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a you know big how, job. How did you like leading a strike group? It was it was a lot of fun. Um, because um, it, it was, especially when I was deployed, it was uh, the, the perfect innovation place for me to be because I was over the horizon. And you ended up in the Persian Gulf when you are deployed. Ended up in the Persian Gulf. Yeah. I was over the horizon. Because this is what, what year is this? Is the Iraq War? Uh, yeah. This is 2005 and 2006. Yeah. Yeah. So once they finish training you up and you're sort of qualified and now you go, they sort of forget about you. And you, you know, you go over the horizon and, and so nobody listens, nobody cares about you. You can do whatever you want. Um, and, <laughs> and, uh, and if, if you have an innovative mindset and you have mm. a cooperative team, you can do some really amazing things. There's probably four or five things we did in that strike group that nobody had ever done before mm. that were remarkable. And I give credit to the people who actually did this stuff. I was just like, why can't we do that? And, yeah. they, oh, pfft, and off they go and do it. But there were really three or four really important things that we did that nobody had done. And it was interesting because, Admiral Mullen came out one time. He was the chief of naval operations at the time. And he wanted to go visit Iraq and see what was going on on the ground because he was a big supporter of our troopers there. And he's just ex he comes out to the ship, and he's just exhausted. He's hardly able to stay awake. And I took him into our combat direction center, and I showed him a couple of these things, and he's like, you know, like this. I'm going, oh, yeah. window of opportunity is closed. The big guy you know, isn't going to see this. Well, he went back the next you know, week and slammed his hand on the counter and said, I want everybody to do what they're doing. Yeah, of course the you know the antibodies come out of the system eventually and try to fight it, but it was it was a remarkable experience mm. to to do that.
Well, I'm gonna. I gotta get to all these questions, otherwise they'll be angry at me because they're very. There's a lot more to talk about, and we'll get okay. to that. Depending, I presume they'll ask you about some of them. But um, one of the things I was surprised about uh, in reading about your strike group command, so you were still flying jets. Oh yeah, you're the strike group commander. Mm -hmm. Just get in, get in your jet and fly yeah, around. Just get no. in the jet and go fly around. Yeah. Now you got yeah. you got attacked for that because they yeah. sort of were portraying mm -hmm. it as like yeah. it's dangerous. You know, yeah. someone might shoot you down. Yeah, but I, then, I, but you, you, you know, you, you argue that it had it sort of very important purpose. It wasn't it was. just a joyride. It was not a joyride. I did not do it because I wanted to go flying. I did it because I wanted to understand what my pilots were experiencing over Iraq. And these were these were hard sorties. You you take off. Uh, it was about a seven and a half hour flight, which is strapped into an airplane. You know, you can't move. It's kind of hard. Mm -hmm. Three different aerial refuelings. You're supporting troops on the ground, and, and I wanted to know whether they were frustrated by anything and mm -hmm. i found out that in fact yes they were frustrated by a few things that we actually changed so uh and and then um as you, to what you alluded to seven months after we returned and i actually had my fleet commander's permission the fifth fleet commander said yes pat walsh was the guy mm -hmm. uh, about eight months after i get back i get this phone call it's like yeah I, I see here on page 78 tailhook magazine i go what I go, you were flying over iraq what the hell and i said well yeah I, I, we did all these great things because i discovered things my jos would have been too afraid to say anything about and i fixed them mm. uh yeah but you know admiral x is pissed it's like uh oh uh, <laughs> yeah that's not a you know i will now read my orders you know yeah. or whatever um and it, and <laughs> i was very fortunate i think that um that this admiral x who was a four star worked for admiral mullen at the time or three star he worked for admiral mullen and i think mullen gave me some top cover there and said no he did exactly the right thing because he had been out there. Mullen had been out there and had seen what we had done. Uh, so I somehow survived that little episode. You made it. You made it through. I you eventually, of course, go on to command uh, or command the mm -hmm. Sixth Fleet, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, become the uh, vice chairman of the Joint yeah. Chiefs. Yeah. I want to talk about that. But I, let me get some of these questions. Describe your first night landing on a carrier. <laughs> I don't remember it. <laughs> yeah, that was so, easy. No. No. Oh, so okay. so i mean you know you show up behind the ship and you know you've been training uh, uh you know, your first uh carrier landings are in the training command they're all day daytime landings and that's like hard enough i don't even remember my first ones there when you get to your fleet fleet airplane and in my, my first f-14 that's when you do the night carrier landing thing the first time and you're you're training at airfields where the runway lights are turned out and the only thing that's on is a box that simulates what the aircraft carries at night and you've got a lens and everything like that but you still have all these cues these depth perception cues you know traffic lights and roads and all kinds of stuff at sea it's just as black as it can be and all you see is that little tiny light down there that's the aircraft carrier and you're going oh my god mm -hmm. i've got to land on that thing and you have to just really discipline yourself to go you know okay the airplane reacts the same thing same way at night as it does in the daytime calm down and do what you're trained to do and it's hard and and you you get better at it because you start to recognize cues and and you know things that you know you just you know like any experiential thing but that first one i was was on a pitching deck off the coast of virginia in a in a in an all-weather suit where you know i was locked in like this and and the deck was moving out of limits but they said you know that's waived you know um and I literally do not remember my first few night carrier landings. What carrier did you do your uh, Nimitz. certification on? Nimitz. The Nimitz. Now, there's an interesting thing that I talk about a little bit in the book about how landing on an aircraft carrier is a right brain activity. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that uh, the right brain or the left brain, which is ser serial processing, and the right brain is parallel processing. The left brain is where most of your short-term memory resides. So if you are really, really, if you got your right brain going and you've turned off your left brain, you're not going to remember very much. Uh, uh, and, that makes and, sense. And yeah, you wrote a paper about yeah, that and, yeah. and being uh, baseball. Yep, ball flying and baseball. Because if you hit a baseball, you got to do it with your right brain, not your left brain. You did have a, um, a uh, you did have a, a emergency experience. Oh yeah, flying. I got I got to jump out of an F-14. Um, that was after you had been an instructor at Top Gun, right? Correct. Here you are, the shot shot. Did read this book? Didn't I you? did. <laughs> He's a hot. Here he is, the hotshot instructor, and then he. And now you're now you're floating uh, 700 miles west of San Diego at night. The taxpayers uh, are going to send you a bill for that F-14 yeah, yeah, that's yeah. At the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, somewhere. not a not. Or was a it recovered? Pleasant. Did they recover the planes? No, it was down. The only thing that ever happened. They was, recovered you. Thank you. Yeah, they think they got me a, a flap. I think washed up in Maui one, you know, like a year later or something. But tell uh, everybody what happened. So I was out, um, you know, 
the whole reason you're flying 700 miles west of San Diego at night is to keep the air wing current because you have to have a night carry landing every seven days or now you have to do a whole bunch of stuff. So if you keep everybody seven days current, you're so we're out there trying to find things to do. So we're running air intercepts on each other. Mm -hmm. And you have these altitude blocks, but um, it, it appeared to me as though there was an airplane that was boresighting me. And, and I had to, you know, this guy was coming right at me and I had to get out of the way very quickly. Well, the F-14 was not very forgiving of that in two ways. One, the engines would stall and it would get in a flat spin. So I'm in a flat spin, but at least my engines have stalled. Mm. Um, uh, and it's very hard to recover from that. And so we had to jump out. Uh, mm. And it was a surreal experience because, you know, you're trained. What you are know, you at, like 10,000 feet? 10,000 feet. We pull the handle. My backseater pulled the handle and off we went. Mm. That's the last I saw of him until we picked him up in the helicopter. Mm. Um, because they picked me up first. Of course, you know, whatever. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pure luck, trust me. But, you know, hanging in that parachute at 10,000 feet, looking at this little pink glow in the horizon, it's like, wow, I guess I got a few things I got to do here. But these things happen, and they don't they don't impact your career. Yeah, I mean, if, if there's no sin of commission involved. Yeah, if you, an accident, you know, yeah, and You did the and, right thing, and the right. machine failed. Yeah, and so it took a few days, you know, a couple of weeks for them to figure out that I was going to be able to fly again, which was a big relief. But, um, you know, Turn a negative into a positive, right? During that two weeks, I wrote a computer program that simulated a tactic that we were, that was a failing tactic in the U.S. Navy. And, uh, you know, do something, you know? As you do. <laughs> just write a computer program in two weeks. All right. So as a Top Gun pilot, did you do any maneuvers with foreign pilots? I guess, or even as a pilot, did you do any maneuvers with foreign pilots? If so, what do you think of those pilots? Yeah, so we did a few uh, as as a Top Gun instructor with foreign pilots, but most of my experience against foreign pilots was when I was in a fleet squadron. Yeah. I actually got to fly against Russian pilots. Mm. Uh, one time we, you know, we as we, a training we, exercise. No, this was uh, real world, and and uh, so we were we would uh, be coasting past Vietnam on the way west, and they had, believe it or not, a Navy squadron of MiG 29s at mm. Camarambe. Bay, and there was this sort of un, they would come out and look at us. Yeah, you know, and. And there was this unwritten agreement that we weren't actually going to shoot at each other. Yeah. But we would do some air combat maneuvering. That's kind of like in the movie, in Top Gun. Yeah, right? it, was a, it was remarkable. It was like, and, and, you know, like, guys have their fangs out. It's like, okay, I want to put me in the airplane. I want to go out and fight against these guys. And I got lucky to do that one time. Mm. But there were other more friendly, um, uh, you know, pilots, countries that we would fly against. And the thing that I'm left with is that, you know, whether you're Air Force, Marine Corps, or Navy fighter pilot, they... They really are the best in the world. I would maybe bring the Israelis up close to that. Um, but it's really be, the, the principal reason. It, obviously, we have great training. But the principal is, reason is that when we train, we keep our egos out of it. Hmm. You know, it, it, it's, it's uh, you know, you check your ego at the door. You're there to learn. And, uh, you know, we're not going to feed your ego when you're, when you're spending all this money to train. So let's jump ahead uh, to your, uh, your last role. Yeah. which was is the second highest commissioned officer in the country, the vice chairman mm -hmm. of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. What is the Joint Chiefs of Staff for the So the, the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, is a, uh, a staff in the Pentagon that works for the chairman and is, is the, the Joint Staff is, to, is there to support the Joint Chiefs. So every service chief, chief of naval operations, commandant of the Marine Corps, whatever, they sort of have two roles. Their role is as a service chief. They're, you know, mm -hmm. the Navy, but right. they're also a joint chief. And, and the joint staff supports that group of people, mm -hmm. principally the chairman and the vice chairman. But, you know, they're, so there are any number of things, whether they're budgetary things, uh, policy things, manpower things, you name it, um, that, that that staff has to do sort of to coordinate the services together. Works very closely with the, um, uh, the OSD, you know, the Office of the Secretary of Defense um, and that sort of thing. But it's a it's a pretty busy place, and I this is my third tour there. I did one tour right after my first you right know, um, before Colin department Paul, head tour, right? and then I did one uh, as the director of strategic plans and policy, working for Admiral Mullen as a three star, and then went off and did the Northern Command NORAD thing, right. and came back as the as the vice chairman. So busy staff. So the vice chairman is that like the vice president, and the chairman's the guy who's important? <laughs> or? Well, you know they have this saying that the. Um, the number two guy gets all the lousy jobs, yeah. and and when a good thing comes to the to the number two guy, the number one guy reaches down and grabs it and yeah. takes it. But, <laughs> but uh, no, seriously, I I I was very very fortunate to sure, work. There's plenty of work to go around. Oh yeah, very fortunate to work with a wonderful Army general named Marty Dempsey, who was the chairman at the time. Mm -hmm. We got along great, and you know the chairman and the vice chairman don't don't always get along. We got along very well, 
And um, you know, I, I principally had three jobs in that role. One was um, to, to you know the manpower piece in terms, you know, not only, for instance, trying to bring the services together to reduce sexual harassment mm -hmm. and sexual assault in the military. That's a very important thing. But also grooming the next, you know, three and four stars. Who are who are they going to be? Mm -hmm. There was a a, a um, so the uh, people component, right? Yeah. There's an investment component. You know, requirements, mm -hmm. uh, you know, budgeting and acquisition where the the vice chairman and the deputy secretary of defense are very closely teamed together to try to kind of rule that mm -hmm. uh, as much as they can. And then there was the policy piece, which was about 1,200 White House Situation Room meetings yeah. uh, with you know any number of you know deputies committee, principals committee, national security council meetings. And the, the thing about it was but, well, that in in the book, I think that came out to me as as something you really enjoyed. Yeah, I did enjoy. I mean, that. there's a tediousness to meetings, but there's you you enjoyed yes. the policy side. You enjoyed I did. the high strategy and policy and. Yep. Well, really, like, how do we solve these intractable problems? Yep. And it, it was a lot like being the CEO of an aircraft carrier in that as an aircraft carrier CEO, you have to understand flight operations really well. You have to understand how to navigate a ship on the surface of the ocean really well. Yep. And you have to understand the nuclear side really well. And you find that the that everybody you work with on the ship is really, really good at one of those things. Mm -hmm. And you're the only person on the ship, literally the only person on the ship that knows all three. And you have to know all three. Mm -hmm. Same thing as the vice chairman. Everybody you're working with in each of those bins is right. a, an expert in those bins, but you got to understand them all. Mm -hmm. So that's why those are very hard jobs. Uh, yeah. Well, they come with a nice house, right? That is, you have that beautiful house. Well, you know, um, I'm, the vice chairman doesn't live in that house anymore. Th this was, oh, is that this right? was, they this took was, this house uh, away. This Carlos, was, are you in that house? Who's in that yeah, house? This, the, the house we were in is a, was a cool house in that it was, it was a uh, Colonel Patton's house yes. on Fort Myer. And he was there stewing. Uh, just before World War II was starting, thinking that he was going to be left out of the war because he was head of a cavalry regiment at Fort Myer. He always yeah. checked ego at the door. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> he did that. And, you know, he ended up doing okay, though, I guess, <laughs> at least for a while. So maybe humility isn't the most <laughs> important thing. Yeah. Now, um, one of the things you, you get into it throughout the book is you, you talk about strategy consisting of balancing four variables. Mm -hmm. One is the environment of the the situation you're in. One is the, in, in the case of military. Uh, then it's then it's the ends, the ways, and the means of, right. of what you're trying to do. So uh, the ends, meaning the national security, right. ends in the case. It's the the ways. It's how are you going to achieve mm -hmm. those ends, and then the means. Where are your money and mm -hmm. resources to right. to achieve that? And, and you talked about in your time, and this would have been. You, you, I guess you left in 2015. So you were there 2011 to 2015. Mm -hmm. So in that moment, you're really dealing with uh, the country trying to rethink or figure out how to pay for our uh, our effort, which had been you know transformed over 20 mm -hmm. years of war fighting and insurgency, uh, counterinsurgency yeah. work. And, and so, could you just talk a little bit about your, you know, your what was happening at that time and sure. how were you trying to make change in 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 that role? Yeah. So, so in the, in the 2014, let's say 2015 time frame, you think back to what we were doing in Iraq and Afghanistan. The, the, we had sort of settled into, I hate to use the term quagmire, but we weren't really, you know, the mission there was to kind of, was beyond countering terrorism. It was to transform two different countries so that terrorism could never come from there again. These were very, very difficult countries. Yeah, it was counterinsurgency and nation building. 20, yeah. 20 years of, I, I, would, I hate to call it a fool's errand, but it, it kind of was uh, after the initial stages of of getting you know the initial mission done we we kind of had mission creep in a major way so so we're dealing with that that's kind of maybe winding down at the same time we're looking straight at china uh you know they didn't waste their their time while we were doing 20 years of counterinsurgency and we're growing uh, quite alarming in their capability and capacity and and, and yeah. their ambition so uh, i know bob work and i work very very hard to try to you know have a little bit of a shift in, into new ways of thinking. Uh, when you when you look uh, at that balance you talked about, you know the uh, the ends were all are kind of the same. Yeah, those are fixed. And if your ends are fixed and your environment is changing around you very rapidly, then you only have two other variables to play with. You either have to get more means, or you have to be more clever in your ways. Yeah. And it was it was kind of apparent to us that the more means were not coming. Yeah. And that, that's the first thing that human beings lunge for. They're still doing it to this day, as Secretary Del Toro will tell you. You know, people are whining like you wouldn't believe. Like, I don't have enough stuff for this program or that program right. or this program. Well, let's step back and look at um, new ways of doing business. And there, uh, I, I've expanded my thinking since 2015 on that, by the way. 
but we really have got to go in that direction because the beans are not not falling off the tree right now. One of the things I liked that you wrote in here was uh, decision making happens better mm -hmm. with a few people with big brains in a room mm -hmm. rather than a bunch of people with little uh, brains. I guess little brains is the implication. Yeah, in in the room, um, and, and because you're tr you're trying to you're trying to think together and and yeah. and innovate mm -hmm. together, you can't have a huge room of people. Right. Uh, you know, I think that the most transformative things that have happened in history, whether you want to talk about Beethoven, Shakespeare, uh, Newton, Einstein, you know, those those have been singular people who were amazingly gifted people. Yeah. We're not talking about that kind of transformation here. We're talking about maybe a notch below that. But it still takes a very special person or group of people to, to make that kind of change happen. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's very, very hard. And I, I call us the, the sort of non-virtuous flywheel that we currently have. And yeah. Where you have. Uh, That's you, a play on the virtuous circle of uh, yeah. Michael Collins. right? But it's yeah. a non-virtuous flywheel. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> where, yeah that, where you have, you know, you have, you have well-meaning warfighters who are looking out there and, yeah. and, you know, they only control the warfighting thing. They don't control the whole interagency thing. And they're going, you know, it's not going so well. Mm -hmm. And they don't have a lot of time to think of new, like radically new ways of approaching a problem. It's like, I got to have more stuff. So they say that the services understandably go, hey, demand signal coming from the field. I'm in a budget battle. I like having more stuff because I've got identity metrics like mm -hmm. ships, airplanes, mm -hmm. troops. So I'm good. Congress, you know, uh, says, yeah, OK, you know, more stuff in my district is good. And then industry, of which I'm a part, uh, says, yeah, we'll build whatever you want us to build. It's very hard. It's a great big ship with a little tiny rudder. It's very hard to change that when what's being asked for is is means more means mm. and, and what's very difficult intellectually is for human beings to say you know there's a different way we have to solve these problems how, how is it going how are things moving what is your impression i mean you're a little on the outside but you're in the industry and obviously you're in the world so. yeah I, I my this is my own personal opinion um I, I believe that we are approaching a similar moment to what you would call a business disruption and a business disruption occurs when mm -hmm. the world changes around a business you know, digital photography comes in when Polaroid's still making wet film, and you just double down. Yeah. You, you you try to do the same thing, more of it and better. Yeah, my horse and buggy business is coming back here at Mount Vernon, though. There you go. Uh, yeah. Well, a lot of people how's that ride. going? <laughs> <laughs> and it's at some point you've got to say, you know, the world is changing, and I've got to think of a new idea. Yeah. And I think there are are ways of doing that. You know, my, you know, when we look at China, um, I, I'm trying to get people to think of the center of gravity of this problem not being just the Chinese military. That's a a center of gravity, but the center of gravity is the Chinese leaders, because you know what does a Chinese leader wake up in the morning and fear the most? No, the people. The people. So, there, there, you know, if you if you bring a whole interagency effort together to include the military, and you you treat that as the center of gravity rather than I got to have more stuff. You're talking about um, like psyops or something like that, like disruption of their trust in the. You're talking about economics. You're talking about information. Yeah. You're talking about diplomacy. You're talking also military. Which, by the way, military can be in support of some of those mm -hmm. things, uh, particularly the economic piece. You know, you want to shut down their commerce. Military can yeah. do that without firing a shot. Um, you know, that sort of thing is it, it, we just need to be uh, going back to first principles, I think, and, and rethinking the problem. Because we don't have the money to buy all, you know, we, you know Secretary of the Tory, but I don't think I can buy 400 ships. I'd love to. I don't know that I can man them, maintain them. Uh, much less by the way. I don't even know if we can make enough uh, submarines and other things right now, right? Yeah. Do we have the industrial base to build? It, it, you know, the I think the most important thing we can build in the Navy right now is submarines. But um, and it is tough because the industrial base is the limiting factor. You know, if it were me, this is again personal opinion. I'd be shifting one of those surface yards into being a nuclear submarine yard, uh, and and because uh, we probably just don't need as many surface ships as as we're you know we could love to have and love to have them well the iraq war has shown i'm uh, not iraq the uh, ukraine war has shown that surface ships incredibly vulnerable i got a great story on that very small I? missiles yeah yeah so uh, so uh when i was the commander of joint command lisbon in my headquarters it's yeah. on the hill looking over the tagus river going into lisbon one day i look out there and there's a big great gray ship going up the river and i get my binoculars up that's a russian ship it turns out it's the the russian ship Moskva. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I I sent a sent a message down to this Russian ship. And I go, I'm coming for lunch. And I go, okay, da. Uh, you know, so I go down there and I'm expecting <laughs> to have a nice lunch, you no, know, and all that, like I would do. They had a little table there that had 
had pitchers of vodka on it hmm. <clears throat> and some little carrots or something like that. So I walk in there <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll take one shot out of respect as your guest. And then you guys do whatever you want. I'm drinking water the rest of it. They go, they go okay. Uh, and they've proceeded to drink every bit of vodka that was on that mm. table. And they were, they were faced, if you'll pardon the expression. Mm -hmm. And then they gave me a tour of the ship. And I was not very oh. impressed by that ship. I can go into detail, but I don't want to take all the time. You can imagine how great it felt for me to see ah, Moscow was sunk by the Ukrainians with a pretty crappy couple of missiles. Mm. And, and, and so I went into some pretty senior guys. I go, what do you think about this Moscow thing getting sunk by these missiles? Oh, yeah. That means we can sink all those Chinese ships. Okay. What about our ships? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, ours are better than the Moscow, to be sure. No question about it. But, yeah. but it's, it is, it, uh, we, have, we haven't faced that. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, our guys in the, in the Red Sea, uh, Secretary of the Torah, tell you, they're doing a marvelous job out there. Hmm. Um, it, it was brilliant for some, whoever the commander was that put them there, because who would have thought the Houthis were going to start launching stuff at ships and at Israel? Yeah. And they're killing it out there right now. So I'm proud of them. Hmm. Here's a question. Uh, what You write in your book uh, when you were a Top Gun instructor that an area of the country had some of the best flying in the world. What does that mean? So this is this is sort of Southern California, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, we would uh, get we would fly a lot of, out over the water. We would fly a lot over Yuma, Arizona, which is kind of a boring desert. But we also got to fly a lot up at China Lake and uh, the, the, the mountainous countryside around China Lake is just spectacular. Mm. Uh, and, you know, if we ever had you know, like a little time between a morning flight with the class and a late afternoon flight with the class and we could get sneak out in an F5 and go raging through the Sierra and Nevada and the mountains, that's pure joy. So you're an adrenaline junkie. How do you feel that now? Um, skiing and really? scuba diving, mostly skiing. Uh, um, we we uh, will be spending Christmas out in Colorado and Mary will be trying to restrain me so that I don't you know injure myself. Um, but. Um, you know, we have a good good time skiing out there. We get uh, our my son's in laws family come comes out. We have about eleven people out there, and we'll, oh. we'll we'll do that. So that's how I get my thrills. But there are other thrills, intellectual thrills too. Well, so uh, the admiral and I were talking earlier. I had the great opportunity about a month and a half ago to to uh, fly onto the USS George Washington at sea in the Cod and the Greyhound and get my honorary tail hook. Um, I'm pretty cool too. Uh, uh, but what'd you think of their their room? Their VIP room was probably pretty cool. Well, it's good. Yeah. Mount Vernon actually is working together with the ship, as you know, it's been refit recently, and they're yeah. redoing their mm -hmm. their museum. And Mount Vernon will have a bunch of wood in there, and the museum is going to be unveiled on February second. Very cool. And we'll have some photos for people. Uh, but one thanks of the things, doing, thanks for doing that, by the way. Well, you know, it's an incredibly important place to take yeah. VIPs. It's also a great place to re-enlist sailors. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful place to make videos for families while you're deployed. So thank you for supporting that. That's great. Well, they've been eager to, and we've been eager to help because, I mean, it's not like the Bush. Jeb Bush can't just fly out there and handshake everybody. And yeah. George Washington has been dead for a while. So, yeah, well, uh, you it, can have somebody made up like George well, Washington. you know, I mean, when I was on Enterprise, I had Klingons walking on my <laughs> flight deck. <laughs> I like that. We do family day cruises. That's true. What's a Klingon doing on my flight deck? <laughs> I like that. Yeah, that's really good. Now we could definitely send to Washington. Down. <laughs> but, uh, but the reason I bring it up is because one of the things I was saying, and I'd like you to reflect a little bit as we close here, I was, uh, rejuvenated really by meeting this incredible crew of people largely between 18 and 24 years old who are running this extraordinary complex dance on the flight deck. They're doing their uh, carrier cert flight certifications uh, in a raging sea because there'd just been that hurricane that was out there and, and you had the swells and the decks moving and there were night landings and, um, and they just treated us with extraordinary professionalism. And to see these young Americans who are the future leaders of this country uh, it, you know, it was really heartening to see these people are already walking in the footsteps of George Washington. They're serving their nation. They're learning how to become a team. They're the United Colors of Benetton. It's uh, all different types of people from all over the place. And I think, you know, congratulations to all you've served. Uh, you know, we, we have this laboratory of citizens make, citizenship making happening right now in this country. It's one of the major problems we have in lack of civics education and lack of history education, transforming young people into American active citizens. But the military is doing it. Uh, and particularly, you know, that experience on yeah. the 
aircraft carrier was just extraordinary there. I know yeah. you're very <clears throat> concerned about the future of our ability to work together. Those kids are, yeah. are giving us a lesson, right? Yeah, now. you know, you think about, um, this is the lower half of a graduating high school class that's out there. And they're, uh, other than in being in actual combat when bullets are flying, this is probably the most dangerous place to work on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if you're on the flight deck of an aircraft yeah. carrier at night, uh, it's just I'm glad they let me just wander out there. That's yeah, great. yeah. Well, we we had we we checked you out. You know, we like, figured... stay behind this line. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you probably had a guy. Know. You might have had somebody grabbing you part <laughs> yeah. of the time. But you know, when you think about it, this this incredibly diverse group of young men and women that are out there, all walks of life, um, yeah. and they're they're coming together every day, and they have a mission, and they cooperate, and they get stuff done. What an example for us old people who aren't doing so well at that right now in our well, country, right? Uh, we can't seem to cooperate, can't work with these other diverse, the, you know, the, the the left and the right are not, you know, playing well in the sandbox together. These kids, they don't even think about that. They're out there, at, you know, very disciplined, probably doing more work before eight o'clock in the morning than most people do all day long. And I'm just immensely proud of them. And and that, I say that that's true for these guys and gals. It's true for the Marines, uh, Army, Air Force, Coast Guard, Space Force, the whole thing. Uh, it's it's a remarkable leadership laboratory. Well, uh, you've given us a lot to think about, and this book will give you a lot more. I hope everybody goes out and, and reads it. And uh, a lot of people sometimes ask me, you know, where are the adults anymore in our country? Where are the leaders? You're up, you have the opportunity to learn from one tonight. He is uh, extraordinary. Thank you so much for being here, and pleasure. I appreciate your kind words. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Oh.